chilling tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Hello, folks. The days are shorter, the nights are disturbingly long, and the things in darkness are gathering. But did you know there's plenty on the Simply Scary Network to ensure your nights are extra chilly? Don't miss the latest episode of Horror Hill with Eric Peabody. New episodes premiering on Thursdays. And, of course, don't forget Drew Blood's Dark Tales, Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and Fear from the Heartland with Paul J. McSorley. You can find them all at the thesimplyscarypodcast.com on YouTube or your favorite podcasting service. Or be sure to visit the chillingtalesfordarknights.com website and become a patron and hear extended episodes from our vast audio archive. Slow down just a little bit. And join us for a scary good time. We're waiting for you. <laughs>
You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two spine-tingling stories. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the dare, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. Thank you for your support. Now... It's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show's about to begin. (laughs) You know what I love about this season? It's the time of year for decorating. Nothing says decoration like the sorts of things I get in the mail from well-wishers and other fine people. For instance... While it's not yet time to get out the candy bowl for those wandering the neighborhood, Kitty Olson has presented me with this delightful sack of candy. And inside is a brand new tale to explain where it came from. I do hope to find out with you, though, dear listener, as uh, there are some stains that seem a little vicious. Without further ado, I present to you the last time I went trick-or-treating. I hate Halloween. Hate it with my whole heart. I rather like that Christmas cheer is encroaching into the month of October so that there's something to blot out all the fake cobwebs and overpriced tacky costumes. On the day of, the porch lights turned off and I've told my kids again and again, they're not going out. Not a chance. As you can imagine, I'm not exactly the most popular dad this time of year. Even my wife thinks I'm being too rigid on this, and she knows what happened to me and what made me like this. Well, she knows the story everyone else knows. Only I know what really happened that night. I was just a kid, a lonely one. It's hard to make friends when you're constantly on the move, military dad. Sometimes only a few months would pass before we'd be packing up to move to yet another place, where I'd have to go to another school and figure out how things work there. By the time I ended up in Falconbridge Elementary, I decided I wouldn't even try to make friends this time. Why bother? I'd just be leaving them soon anyway. But life decided to throw Curtis Riker my way. He was in my grade, but he was a year older. He was held back a year. Rumors about why ranged from getting kicked out for blowing up a toilet in the boys' bathroom to getting into a fist fight with a middle schooler. I believed both could have happened. Curtis was a wild child freckled with mischievous grin full of gaps where he had missing teeth and red hair going every possible direction, like he'd stuck a fork in an electric socket. I don't know what drew me to him, but on the third day at Falconbridge, he and his posse plopped their lunch trays next to mine, and Curtis asked if I had ever shot one of my dad's guns. The answer was no, but I lied and told him I had. That was the right answer because Curtis immediately took me into his crew. He was the de facto leader, of course. He was too loud and opinionated not to be. The other boys, Todd, Christian, Luke, and Alan, they never questioned him. They practically worshipped the ground he walked on, and soon I was, too. In hindsight, they were all jerks, but in hindsight, I guess since I was one of them, I was a jerk, too. At that age, I actually liked Halloween. Most kids do. Wear a fun costume, get piles of free candy. What's not to like? That year, I decided to be a scarecrow. And this year, I wasn't going to have my parents with me. I was going with my friends. My mom was naturally a little hesitant not to go with me. But my dad came through for me that night. After I promised to be back by ten, he smacked me on the back, teasingly pushed my hat into my eyes, and told me to go have fun. I met everyone right outside Curtis's house. Most everyone was already there. Todd, in his zombie costume, moaned about brains. Christian waved around his pirate sword. 
Luke bared his cheap plastic fangs at me with a a vent to suck your blood line. And Alan was already having to rewrap himself in toilet paper as his mummy costume was already falling apart. Curtis came out exactly five minutes later than we agreed to meet. He probably made us wait on purpose now that I think about it. Way to exercise his power over us. His costume was pretty low effort. Fake cut on the cheek, catch blood on his black clothes, and a fake bloody knife strapped to his waist. A serial killer, he said, as if that explained everything. It certainly didn't explain the stuffed pillowcase thrown over his shoulder. Curtis snickered as he looked over each of our costumes, offering his creative criticism. Christian needed to get a new costume idea since it was the third year running that he was a pirate. He asked if Alan was dressed like a piece of poop. I'd chosen a baby costume. It was embarrassing, but since we all got the same treatment, we all just laughed it off. None of us judged his costume back, though. We knew better. Well, come on, there's candy waiting for us. Curtis waved his knife about. I know the best neighborhoods, Michael. They won't mind your baby costume. They all charged down the street, and soon we were just one of the many gaggles of kiddos out for treats. You should have known we were some of the kids out for tricks, though. When an old lady had the unfortunate decision of handing out apples, Curtis pulled quite the face. Apples? Gross. He tossed it up and down before he threw it into the sidewalk. Now I understood the pillowcase as he produced a dozen eggs. Alan, you can do the honors. <laughs> With pleasure. Alan snatched two eggs from the carton. He reeled his fists back and sent them flying into the window. The oak splattered across the glass and oozed to the ground. And Curtis threw his head back and laughed like it was the funniest thing he'd ever seen. Come on. We didn't get a treat, so they get tricked. We all ran down the sidewalk before we could get yelled at for being little jerks. Curtis cackling all the way. I was laughing too, but it wasn't because it was funny. It was the kind of laugh you made when you were terrified you were going to get caught. If I got caught egging some nice old lady's house, I wouldn't be let out of my room until I turned 18. Once we got away, though, I couldn't deny that thrill. I'd been a part of something bad, and that was fun. Curtis was the judge of what houses gave good candy. It wasn't always apples or pennies that earned his ire. Turned out he had a serious peanut allergy, so if the house only had candy with nuts in it, he'd bust out a roll of toilet paper or hand out eggs. He never actually did the teeping or egging himself. It was up to one of us. I was both excited and afraid for my turn. But he didn't choose me for that. He had something worse in mind. It was near the end of the night and we'd all had the sugary loot kids could want. Curtis wasn't settled, though. I could see by how he was tapping his foot and scanning his eyes that he wanted to do something else. Hey, Michael! The hair in my neck stood up. Curtis had a sly grin on his face, and he nodded across the street. I know of a way to get some more candy. Look at that baby over there. I looked over and saw the baby he was talking about. This little girl was probably no older than five and definitely shouldn't have been trick-or-treating on her own. But there she was, skipping down the sidewalk, clutching a bright pink jack-o'-lantern bucket that was overflowing with candy. You got the baby costume? Go distract her while we get in position. I swallowed. What are you going to do? I asked. Curtis grinned wickedly. Good to scare her, that's all, he said in a voice that tried and failed to sound innocent. I wasn't a stupid kid. I could put together what he was planning on doing. I wanted to say no, that we already had enough candy. We didn't really need to take anyone else's, especially our little girls. But I wasn't brave enough. I nodded dumbly before I cut across the street. The guy's whispers faded into silence as I stepped in front of the little girl. She was so tiny. 
Her dress was just as pink as her candy bucket, with plastic wings attached to the back and a tiara sitting crookedly in her blonde curls. She smiled up at me with no fear, no suspicion. Hello, she chirped, cocking her head to the side, almost making her tiara fall off. I almost threw up with nerves, but I put on a smile. Hi, uh, I'm Michael. What's your name? Call me Daisy. She giggled. Are you a scarecrow tonight, Michael? Uh-huh. I could see movement out of the corner of my eye. What are you? I'm a fairy princess. Daisy curtsied with one hand. I like being a princess. Before I could find any other way to drag out this conversation, Curtis leaped out from the bushes and snapped up the little girl. Pressing the fake knife to her neck, he hissed. You want to die tonight, little girl? What's more frightening than something hiding in your closet, waiting for you to fall asleep so it can come out and have itself a little midnight feast? Well, quite possibly trying to stop a bad habit, cold turkey. But why subject yourself to that? There are lots of little things you might be doing that aren't bad habits themselves, and those little things could be the key to making or breaking your commitment. That's why I recommend doing, as thousands of others have, and try the benefits of Fume. Fume's not an electronic device. It's an air device made of beautifully polished wood and sliding metal parts. There's a delightful assortment of flavors, ranging from orange vanilla to the more exotic maple pepper. With special flavors and a device great for fidgety fingers, there's no reason I can think of to not try it out today. Stopping is something we all put off because it's hard. But switching to Fume is easy, enjoyable, and even fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers and has thousands of success stories, and there's no reason that can't be you. Join Fume in accelerating humanity's breakup from destructive habits by picking up the Journey Pack today. Head to tryfume.com and use code DARK to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code DARK to save an additional 10% off your order today. Daisy's cheer melted into sheer terror. She shrieked and tried to squirm free, but Curtis had such a tight grip on her, I'm sure he left bruises. Alan swooped out and snatched away her bucket. That's mine, Daisy cried out. Curtis just shoved her into the ground. Her tiara did pop off this time, rolling down the cracked pavement and coming to a stop a few feet away. It's ours now, you dumb baby. Curtis sneered before he pulled one of his feet back. Before I could stop him, he kicked that poor little girl so hard in the ribs she nearly went into the street. She laid still for a moment before she looked up at us, dirt on her cheek, and a bruise forming on her chin. Her bottom lip trembled for a moment before she wailed, Mama! Mama! Help me! Come on, let's go. Curtis dashed away, whooping and hollering like he'd pulled off some grand theft. I couldn't look at Daisy anymore, but I could hear her crying and screaming for her mommy as we made our great escape. I felt like the worst person alive. Even as I accepted the cut of the spoils, I wanted to die from the shame. I should have turned around. I should have just left the group right then. But I never got the chance before we met her. We turned the corner and there she was, a woman taller than my dad, her smooth young face not matching her white flowing hair, wearing a silver gown and a shimmering cape. We all skidded to a stop and stared at her. The way she was looking right at us was like she was waiting for us. After a brief pause, the woman walked up to us. There was a smile on her lips, but that didn't reach her eyes. And something about it sent chills up my spine. Now that I think back on it, she looked at us like cats look at a nest of baby mice. Oh, my, 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 what wonderful costumes. 
She tilted her head to the side, her eyes landing on the pink bucket that Luke was holding at the moment. You seem to have an extra candy bucket. Who does that belong to? You could hear a pin drop with how quiet it was. Where did all the people go? At the moment, we seem to be the only people in the universe, let alone on the street. Why wasn't anyone still out trick-or-treating? At the very least, the stragglers should still be heading home. Luke gulped and stared at the sidewalk. Um, we just uh, found it, he mumbled. The woman heaved a big sigh and frowned. Did you now? I blinked and missed it. One second, she was standing in front of us with a disapproving look. The next, she'd heaved Luke up with a single hand, fingers digging into his neck. Luke dropped the candy bucket as he tried to fight her, chocolate bars and lemon candies spilling onto the ground and rolling away. Curtis reacted first, puffing up and trying to act brave, as he grabbed the woman's arm to try and make her let go of Luke. Let him go, lady. What's your problem? He snapped. My problem? The woman hardly seemed bothered by Luke's squirming or Curtis's pulling of her arm, just slowly looking down at us with the iciest of glares. My problem is lying, rotten little boys that steal from my child. Now run as fast as you can. The hunt's begun. At the moment, we heard a howl, followed by the baying of hounds and a mischievous bell-like laughter. The laughter was more frightening than the howl. Curtis took off first and Alan was hot on his heels. I paused for only a moment longer, just long enough to see the woman dig her fingers deeper into Luke's skin and then hear a snap as she broke his neck. Luke gurgled for a second before going completely limp. That got me running. Me, Todd, and Christian all screaming in terror. That woman had killed Luke with her bare hand. Not hands, a single hand. There was no conscious end to my spirit. I just ran for my life. And so did everyone else. Alan tripped. I don't know if he caught his foot on something or if the toilet paper that made up his costume caused him to fall, but he fell on his face. He groaned, and I stopped to help him, but that's when the dogs appeared. They were huge, taller than a Great Dane, but with a muscular build like a Rottweiler. Their shining silver coats were spattered shortly in red as they pounced on Alan's fallen body. They didn't go for the kill. They tore away at him, Alan screaming and trying to fight back. It was only one boy against five monstrous canines. One grabbed onto his face, tore his cheek clean off before it looked up at me. I looked back into its eyes, its dozen yellow eyes. At least a dozen, I couldn't be sure. How many eyes it really had didn't stick around to count. I just shouted, I'm sorry, to the still screaming Alan before I ran again. We heard Alan screaming blocks away. It was strange. I didn't know the neighborhoods we were in. I don't think any of the other boys did either. The world around us seemed distorted. Streets leading to nothing, their signs scrambled around and spinning like small whirlwinds. It didn't really sink in until Christian suddenly broke right. He was trying to do the smart thing. He headed right into one of the houses. He slammed up against the door before he began pounding away at the wood and turning frantically at the doorknob. Help! There's dogs out here trying to kill us! Open up! Help! He screamed so loud it sounded painful. I nearly got hope in my heart when the door slowly opened. I was halfway across the yard myself when I saw who was opening the door. It was a teenager dressed all in white, with features sharp like glass and a smile that didn't speak of good things. Oh, nice sword. He plucked it from Christian's hand, twirling it around twice, before he stabbed Christian. The plastic sword wasn't anymore. It slid between his ribs like a knife into hot butter. Christian sputtered his face, going dead white, as he was dragged inside. I heard him scream once more. Saw blood spray across the front window. 
and then I was gone as Curtis screamed that it was too late, that we needed to keep going. We really weren't home anymore. I don't know where we were. There wasn't going to be any help for us, though. The houses were all dark. The streetlights flickered. Sometimes, not going dark, too, before going on so bright I felt the bulbs would burst. Todd was cussing up a storm by this point, using words I didn't even know existed. This is all your fault, Curtis. It's your friggin' fault. He got out between his pants. He had to be getting tired. He wasn't an athletic kid. I wasn't either, and my lungs were burning, my legs aching. Curtis glared at Todd before he clearly landed on a solution. Into the woods. We can lose him in there, he pronounced before sliding down into the ditch and bolting into the trees. I followed. I thought it was a good plan. Todd did too, even if he kept swearing himself blue. Curtis was still the leader of our group. What was left of it, anyway. I almost, almost had hope we'd really get away now. Dogs were getting quieter. The world didn't seem so warped and foreign now. Curtis held up his hand, and we all stopped, finally taking the chance to catch our breaths. Not a second passed, and something scraped my cheek and thudded hard into the tree next to me. Blood dripped down my face as I stared at the offending object in question. An arrow. An actual arrow. Flutched with white feathers. And skein back to running. It hurt to run. Every part of me ached as we now had to tear through brush and jump over roots to avoid the same fate as our friends. Sometime during the chase, my scarecrow hat got knocked off. I didn't even bother to look back at it. I didn't want to see our pursuers getting closer. They're doing this on purpose. Todd gasped and finally stumbled to a stop. They're just gonna, gonna chase us to death. I heard a thud and an arrow sprouted out from his belly, the tip dripping red. Todd's face went stark white as he looked down. Then almost immediately, six more arrows were sticking out from him in all directions. One even coming out from his eye. He started to crumble, but I didn't stop long enough to see him fall to the ground. Even if I realized how hopeless it was, I kept going. We were being chased again. The dogs were baying again, but they stayed the same distance. The arrows just barely missed us, but that wasn't because they couldn't hit us. They could. They were just waiting for us to give up. They were going to kill us. They were just going to wait for us to give up first. I cried and bawled my eyes out, snot dripping down my lips as I stumbled through the dark, tears stinging my eyes so badly I could barely see. Stop crying, you big baby! Curtis glared at me, his face flushed redder than his hair. His voice was raspy from all the panting we were doing, and for a second, I thought he was going to hit me. Then he seemed to get an idea. Look, big tree, he pointed ahead. Let's climb it. If we get up high enough, they won't be able to hit us. That sounded stupid, but my tired brain just couldn't disagree. I put on that last burst of speed, praying I'd reach that tree before they got me. And then Curtis stuck out his foot and tripped me. I bashed my face open on the ground, blood gushing out of my nose as my vision blurred for a brief moment. When it cleared, I saw that Curtis was already halfway up the tree. He left me to die. I sobbed into the ground as shadows stretched over me. All of the hunters were dressed in white, their outfits strangely unblemished from dirt or leaves. There was the woman again, tall, with an arrow notched in her bow. And hanging off her back was Daisy, her face bruised, eyes still red from her tears. Funny part about all this, I hadn't actually let go of my sack of candy. If anything, my grip became like iron. I I sniffled before I got up to my knees. I'm so so sorry. I didn't want to do it. I did it, though, and I'm so, so sorry. Here. I lifted the bag as high as I could. You can have mine. Just take it. I don't... 
I don't want to die. It was quiet again. Even the dogs had stopped barking. Daisy looked over her mother's back, landing on the ground and walking up to me. I was shaking. I think I wet myself. She managed to pry the sack of candy from my frozen grip and looked inside. Oh, wow, Mama, look. There's even more candy in here. She showed off her new howl to her mother, beaming with joy. You don't have to kill that one, Mama. It's okay. You made it better. The woman mulled it over, tapping her fingers against a bow as she considered it. Finally, she sighed and nodded. Yes, dear, that one can live. He has some manners, and I think he's learned his lesson. What about the other boy? Oh, no, you can kill that one. He was the one who shoved me in the ground and kicked me. Daisy pulled out a packet of candy corn and gasped. Ooh, my favorite! Her mother nodded before she walked past us. I was shocked. I was being spared. I was being left alive. And Curtis's attempt to hide up in the tree had not gone well. The woman raised her hand and waved it side to side. Before my eyes, I watched two birch trees sprout from the ground. They didn't get too big, but they got big enough for her plans. She whistled, and two hunters launched themselves up the tree. In a second, they had Curtis by the shirt and were dragging him back down. He fought like hell, kicking and screaming, and even trying to bite them, but it was for nothing. He was dragged between the trees. Here, have some candy. Daisy handed me a piece of candy corn as Curtis was strapped to the trees. I didn't eat it. I just clutched onto it and watched. The trees were bent down as far as they could go. Curtis looked at me. He was probably going to shout for help, to ask me to save him. I just stared blankly as the trees were let go. The force of the trees whipping back up. Tore him in half. Right down the middle. Blood and gore sprayed across the clearing. Some getting to my face. The group all cheered and I finally passed out. When I woke up, I was in a hospital bed. My mother was crying. She didn't say anything when I called out for her. She just launched herself and gripped me so tight, my ribs just about popped. Between her sobbing, she told me that she'd opened the door to cops on the front porch. I'd been taken to the hospital. My friends were found up and down the street. Some psycho had attacked us and left us for dead. Only I was still alive. I wanted to think it was a dream, that I'd just been attacked by some psycho, and my mind just made up all the other things that happened. But when I unfolded my hand, I found a half-melted piece of candy corn stuck to the center of my palm. Folks, we like to deal with the strange, the unsettling, and the terrifying. But once the show's over, you can rest assured that everything was in good fun. And while your dreams may be pleasantly spooky, it's okay, because all the monsters have gone back to the world of imagination. But what if, dear listener, there were stories that were so strange, so unusual, but it turns out they're all true? If something like that is to your taste, then perhaps you'll be like me and take a listen to I Hear Fear. Join host Carrie Mulligan as you hear about forest dwellers that lure teenagers in and try to hold them in their clutches forever, beauty products gone horribly wrong, and DJs whose antics turn deadly. These stories and more are all there to give you the shakes as you journey into the darkest reaches of the unknown and all the more frightening as they really did happen. I recommend giving a listen, but be careful. Those screams you hear might be your own. Follow I Hear Fear on the Wondery app or wherever you get your podcasts. You can binge all episodes of I Hear Fear ad-free right now by joining Wondery Plus. Plus. 
I hope you enjoyed The Last Time I Went Trick-or-Treating by Kitty Olson, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support her by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash kitty dash Olson. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash K-I-T-T-Y dash O-L-S-E-N. Author of several books, she continues to haunt the annals of Reddit as the odd cat lady. You can always find more of her works on her website, theoddcatlady.com as well. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. Remember, people, stealing is just wrong. But now that I think about it, maybe getting this bag wasn't such a nice thing. You never know who procured it in the first place. I'd rather not have a hunt show up on my doorstep. I just don't have the space for that many guests. But look here. Like Edward shipped me a fairly large container. Be sure to decorate, Otis. We wouldn't want you to be without. Ah, what a nice note. And look at that. Another story to go with it. But what's in this box? Oh, well, it appears to be, uh, well, a lot of Halloween decorations. Maybe if we read a story, we'll get a little more information. Without further ado, I present to you The New Ways. At first, the Vogels looked like a good fit for the neighborhood of Oakdale Way. Sinclair and Nadia were both in their late 20s, and they were exactly the right mix of friendly but not pushy to fit in well with families already in the area. Their son, Rutger, had just turned six years old, which gave them an excellent reason to meet up with the other young parents in the subdivision. In no time, they were being invited to summer barbecues and pool parties, exchanging tools and recipes and babysitting favors with everyone else like they'd been there for years. Things were still fine in September. Rutger went off to his new school already knowing a number of his classmates, which made the transition easier on him. Nadia and Sinclair were active in the neighborhood fantasy football league. Everything was going swimmingly right up until October 1st. All around the neighborhood, ladders appeared on houses and extension cords snaked across lawns as the families of Oakdale Way began to put up their Halloween decorations. Some simply hung a few strings of orange and purple lights from the gutters, and set up a small plastic graveyard in the front lawn and called it a day. Others went all out with inflatable ghosts, animatronic zombies, and strobing lights. By the end of the first weekend in October, every house in the street had been transformed into a brightly colored tribute to Halloween. All that is except one. The Vogels had not put up so much as a single fake spider web to acknowledge the holiday, their house was the lone spot of darkness in the midst of the pop-up carnival atmosphere, lit only by the plain white torchlights on either side of their front door. The first to approach the new neighbors was Al Francesco, their next-door neighbor. He spotted Sinclair outside blowing the leaves off his lawn and waved him over. You uh, folks are going to be getting your decorations up soon, he asked. Looks like you're the last ones this year. Sinclair just chuckled. I wasn't really planning on putting anything up. We're not much for Halloween in this house. Well, sure, everyone's got their own tastes. Sit down. Obviously, no one's going to ask you to go all out like the Raynells. But if you just put up a few lights, it'd really complete the look of the neighborhood. It's just not something I'm interested in doing, anyhow. Is this something that's required around here? I don't recall there being any neighborhood covenants in the paperwork I signed. I can go check on that if I need to. No, no, it's definitely not a requirement. Participation's completely optional, and no one will tell you different. It's just a thing we like to do. You've been getting along so well with everyone here, I figured I'd keep the ball rolling in that direction. Well, I appreciate your suggestion, Sinclair said, 
I hope this doesn't get us kicked out of the fantasy football league or anything. Oh, no, of course not. Everyone's still happy to have you, said Al. Talk it over with Nadia, though, yeah? Just a couple of strands of light, so that we don't have to have a dark spot in the middle. I'll talk to her about it, Al, Sinclair said. But she and I are on the same page on this one. We're not big fans of Halloween. Al shrugged. Not a problem. Just wanted to let you know the general vibe of the neighborhood. You folks still planning on joining us on Sunday for yard games? We'll be there. The two men parted with a friendly wave and Al said no more about the decorations. He'd given it his best shot and it hadn't landed. Hopefully others would have better luck. Al's conversation, of course, was only the first salvo. The next to try was Corrine, the mother of one of Rutger's neighborhood friends. She brought it up with Natty at the playground a few days later, offering many of the same arguments that Al had. Nadia, like her husband, expressed polite disinterest in the entire idea. It simply wasn't their thing, she told Corrine. They didn't hold the decorations against any of their new neighbors. They just weren't going to participate. A few other subtle hints were dropped in passing conversations that week, all alluding to the idea that it would certainly look nice if the entire street was decorated. The Vogels ignored these sallies. No one pressed the point. The second weekend of October passed. Leaves tumbled from the trees in unending quantities. The Oakdale families waved cheerfully at each other from their prospective front lawns. An army outfitted with rakes and leaf blowers, wheelbarrows and tarps. Children leaped shrieking into the neatly raked piles, scattering them once more. The nights were rich with the smell of wood smoke and alive with the dancing lights of the decorations. The Vogel's house remained dark. The neighborhood held its collective tongue for a week. Sinclair and Nadia, who had begun to tense up when they saw their neighbors approaching, relaxed once more. Conversations returned to their usual light topics, how the children were doing in school, what local restaurants were worthwhile, and so on. Halloween wasn't mentioned. The decorations were not brought up. The Vogels, glad to be past this minor point of contention, forgave their neighbors for their misplaced zealotry. Until Sunday, when the doorbell rang and Sinclair found a man in blue jeans and a ratty shirt on his front steps. Howdy, said the stranger. I'm Terrence. Sorry to bother you, but I was just in the neighborhood putting up some decorations and I noticed your house was bare. Since I'm already here, I can give you a good deal on hanging some stuff if you want. Uh, you were just in the neighborhood, Sinclair said flatly. He leaned against the door for him and gave the man a sour look. Uh, yeah, I'm a handyman and this is one of the odd jobs I do. Halloween and Christmas. Turns out there's a lot of folks who don't like to get on a ladder. He offered the homeowner a business card. Sinclair made no move to take it. Which house were you at? Oh, just down the street there. Terrence gestured vaguely. Yeah? Well, who lives there? Well... Sinclair cut him off. Hey, don't bother lying to me. Every single house on this street has been absolutely dripping in these garish decorations for the entire month. I swear half of these folks got up at midnight on October 1st just to put them up. There's not one house here that you could possibly have been doing work on besides mine. I promise you, I didn't call you here, and I don't want you here. Terrence fell back in the face of a sudden stream of vitriol. Hey, no problem, mister. I was just offering. Don't, Sinclair spat. Whatever weird trick you're pulling, whatever scam you're selling, leave my family out of it. He slammed the door. Nadia gave him a quizzical look as he stomped back into the living room. There's something wrong with this entire neighborhood, he muttered, turning on the TV. It was in the middle of an ad for monster-themed cereal. Sinclair snorted in disgust. There's something wrong with this whole country. On Tuesday, Rutger came home from school with a small decorative gourd with a face painted on it. His parents praised his art skills and dropped it in the trash when he wasn't looking. Nadia called the school and demanded that her son be exempted from any further Halloween activities. The administrator, who knew not to pick a fight, 
passed the message along to Rutger's teacher with a sigh. The teacher, who didn't live on Oakdale Way, promised it wouldn't happen again. On Thursday, Sinclair called Joe Hernandez, another Oakdale parent, to let him know that his son Eddie would not be welcome at their house this evening as previously planned. Did the boys get into a fight at school, Joe asked? Uh, something like that. Your son told mine that on Halloween night, the Dark Walkers were going to rip in pieces because he hadn't put up the Halloween decorations. Yeah, said Joe. Kids, huh? Such imaginations. Yes, he also told Rutger that his mother and I would be torn to shreds by those same Dark Walkers and that no one would ever find all the pieces of our bodies. He came home in tears, begging us to put up some lights so that he, and I quote, doesn't have to see what mommy and daddy's guts look like. There was an uncomfortable silence. He's six, Joe. This isn't something he should be hearing in first grade. I mean, Joe began with another pause. If it'll make you feel better, have you considered... He stopped when he realized that Sinclair had ended the call. In the fourth weekend of October, with just days to go until Halloween, the Vogel's house was still firmly undecorated. No jack-o'-lantern sat upon the steps. No festive cover adorned the mailbox. They remained a lone, banal island in the midst of a sea of festivity. By awkward coincidence, Al Francesco was heading down to check his mailbox at the same time that Sinclair was returning from his. As the two men passed in their respective driveways, Sinclair gave a curt nod but did not slow his steps. Hey, Sinclair, Al began. Sinclair turned. Al, I mean this with complete sincerity. If the next words out of your mouth have anything to do with Halloween, we will never talk again. Nadia and I are well aware of the neighborhood's thoughts on our undecorated house, and I think at this point we've made our stance pretty clear in return. Halloween is a grotesque holiday mocking death and celebrating greed. It encourages capitalistic excess for sugar highs and short-lived, shoddily made decorations. While we fully understand that Rutger is going to be exposed to that out there in the world, we have no intention of reinforcing such a thing in our house. Uh, you're all welcome to have your big block party. We don't begrudge you that. All we're asking is for the same courtesy in return. You do whatever you want and let us do the same. Frankly, I can't see why that's so hard for all of you to accept. You're totally right, Al said. I'm sorry if folks have been pressuring you. Heck, I'm sorry for doing it myself. None of us meant anything bad by it. We were just trying to be good neighbors. Folks went a little overboard, and I can definitely see how that rubbed you the wrong way. This is on us, not on you. Well, I appreciate the apology. Have you folks uh, thought about going somewhere else for Halloween? There'll be a big street party here, like you said. I often goes pretty late and can get pretty raucous, since we all know everyone's out there with us. I'd hate to think we'd be keeping you folks up. We'll be fine. Probably be kind of hard for Rutger, too, hearing all the other kids whooping it up outside. Might be easier on him if you were at a hotel or something. Plus, school's doing the costume contest that day, I know, and... Sinclair rounded on his neighborhood. What are you trying to pull? It's clear that everyone here is Halloween crazy, and fine, that's all great for all of you, but leave us out of it. We'll be at home with the porch lights off and what I've always understood to be the universal symbol of leave us alone, there's no candy here. My wife, my son, and I will have a perfectly nice evening in our own house, with our own food, with our own entertainment. You can spread the word that if I find eggs in my house or toilet paper in my trees, I'll track down whoever's responsible and sue their parents until they're so broke that they can't afford to celebrate Halloween. Al watched his neighbor storm up the driveway. The front door slammed behind Sinclair so loudly that it echoed off the houses across the street. The sound had a severe finality to it. On the night of Halloween, Oakdale Way was awash in activity. The ends of the neighborhood had been blocked off with traffic cones to prevent anyone from driving a car through the festivities. 
Every household had brought folding tables out into the street in Paltham High with candies, cakes, drinks, and more. There were sparklers and bottle rockets, boom boxes, and noisemakers. Children ran wildly up and down the street, grabbing candy from their bowls and stuffing it into their bags. Their parents watched from a distance, making sure only that the children stayed within the safety of the coned-off area. Flashlights flickered everywhere, though they were hardly necessary, in a profusion of lights that adorned every house. Absolutely everyone wore a costume. In the center of it all, the Vogel's house was darker than ever, with even its plain white torchlights turned off. Inside, they'd pop popcorn and settle down on the couch to watch an animated movie. Anytime Sinclair saw his son's head turn at the sound of excited shouts from outside, he turned out the volume to drown him out. He and Nadia were determined to have a fun evening their way. They didn't want Rutger dwelling on what fun he might be missing out on. Staying up late with snacks in a movie was plenty of fun all by itself. Outside, the party surged on, the children shrieked, and sped up as the sugar took hold. Likewise, the adults' volume and jocularity rose as the levels in their drinks fell. It was barely contained chaos. And then suddenly, all at once, there was a lull. There was nothing planned, nothing anyone had intended. By happenstance, all of the conversations reached a pause at the exact same moment. All of the children had paused to take a breath or guzzle down more apple cider. Every song playing over every speaker hit an instant of silence. For just one breath, the entire street was still. Immediately after, it exploded back into motion and activity. The conversations buzzed, the children shouted, the party thrived. But in that lacuna, something else had joined. There were figures now that it hadn't been there before. No one had seen them arrive. No one acknowledged their presence now. They wore tattered robes that had once been black, but had faded into an unhealthy grayish green. Their faces were covered by chipped and battered plastic masks. They showed unknown cartoon characters, bizarre animals, and caricatures of people no one recognized. They moved among the tables, tasting the desserts and drinks. They didn't speak to anyone. No one acknowledged their presence. The figures didn't move in a group. While one was plucking a piece of candy from a bowl, another would be rising the bottom of its mask to sample the cider. One would run clawed fingers along a chain of lights, tapping on a burned-out bulb while another hovered just outside the glow cast by the lit jack-o'-lantern. They were everywhere on the street at once. It was impossible to say how many there were. Perhaps there were only two. Perhaps there were dozens. One tapped bony feet up the empty cement steps of the Vogel's house and pressed its body flat up against the door. Another was on the roof, sliding its palms over the empty edges of the gutters. More glued themselves to every window, their masks uttering sharp cracks as the ancient plastic was forced against the glass. They surrounded the house, robes fluttering. In the darkness, no one saw. Sinclair stepped into his kitchen and found a figure in dark grayish green robes munching on his leftover popcorn. Who are you? he demanded. The mask swiveled up to regard him with hollow eyes. The wearer said nothing but merely stuck the last kernel of popcorn through unmoving plastic lips. Get out of my house, said Sinclair. No jack-o'-lanterns carved, said a voice next to him. He whirled to find a second robed figure mere feet away. No lights hung, said another. It was impossible that he had not seen them all as he entered the kitchen. No offerings made, said the first one he'd seen, letting the now empty popcorn bowl drop. That which is not given must be taken. This voice came from behind. That which is not protected must be claimed. This one from above. When the new ways are not observed, the old ways hold sway. Sinclair was frozen in place. The robe figures swirled through the kitchen like sharks. Their decrepit masks leered at him as they swung past. 
In the same moment that Sinclair realized he could no longer hear the movie from the other room, the first screams rang out from his wife and son. His body released in that moment, and he leapt for the door to the family room, only to be borne down to the floor as the robe figures rushed him. He screamed his wife's name once more. After that, the screams were only wordless agony. The robe figures were not fast workers. The Vogels all screamed for a very long time. Outside, however, the sound was subsumed by the joyous shrieks of the children and drowned out by the music. No one heard anything at all, although a few did increase the volume on their speakers to make certain that this was the case. After all, later they agreed it was a great tragedy what had happened to the Vogels. They all hoped that the police would be able to find out whoever had done it, though they had no real belief that this would be the case. After all, they hadn't even been able to find all the pieces of their bodies. The house eventually went back on the market after being sufficiently cleaned. The realtor was urged to ask any prospective buyers how they felt about Halloween. It was very important to the residents of Oakdale Way, she was told. Some of them took it very seriously. I hope you enjoyed The New Ways by Micah Edwards, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that tale and would love to read more from tonight's very talented feature author, you can help support him by visiting simplyscarypodcast.com slash Micah Edwards. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash M I C A H dash E D W A R D S. You can visit his other stories and his website, but keep a lookout. If he's not writing, he's probably dead. Thanks again for your support of this program and tonight's featured author. And a big thank you for all the authors we featured on this final episode of Season 13. We hope you enjoyed yourselves immensely. We certainly did. And stay tuned for the second part of our Halloween extravaganza, which will begin Season 14 the right way. We'll have all new stories, all new surprises, and lots of creepy fun as we lead you through the spooky holiday season, the new year, and beyond. 2024 looks like it'll be quite the spectacle. Now, before we go, I'd also like to take a moment to thank you personally for joining me on this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference, and it would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium, extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring Twice the Terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase season passes for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, or X, Instagram or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well at the Otis Jiry channel, where you'll find releases of my series, Horror Storytime, dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, slash X, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Jiry. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep, if you can. <laughs>Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, 
and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, the Otis Jiry channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.